Good morning. We're going to call the uh, November 18, 2009, Oklahoma City Post Employment Benefits Trust to order. And I've got item two um, approve the minutes of the August 12th, 2019 meeting. Move it. Got a motion. You got a second? Second. Second. All in favor, just say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Um, item three we have a resolution to recognize, commend, and thank Bob Ponkilla for his service to the Oklahoma City Post Employment Benefits Trust. As many know, Bob is retiring December 2nd, and uh, I'd ask the Secretary to read the resolution. Wes, Bob, do you want to come up to the podium? Whereas Bob Ponkilla has been a city employee for 36 years and 12 years as city treasurer of the city of Oklahoma City in the finance department. Whereas Mr. Ponkilla is responsible for managing the city's investment program, banking relationships, and revenue enforcement program. Whereas Bob's service experience includes president of the Association of Public Treasurers, USNC, member of the OMC TFOA board, member of the Oklahoma Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Education Committee, and municipal liaison board with the Oklahoma Municipal League. Whereas Bob has served as the surrogate general manager of the Oklahoma City Post-Employment Benefits Trust since the inception in 2008. Now therefore be it resolved by the trustees of the Oklahoma City Post-Employment Benefits Trust that they do hereby commend and thank Bob Ponkilla for the service and dedication that he has provided to the Oklahoma City Post-Employment Benefits Trust. Can I get a motion? Move approval. <laughs> Second. Second. Any comments? Bob, it's, it's so much more than just what that resolution <laughs> said. I hope that when you think back on your experience with the city, you know that you were part of so much more than just this. This is from the OPEB Trust. People don't even know how much involvement you've had over the years in making this city's accountability so much better and our performance in terms of sales tax, use tax, hotel tax, so many things. So thank you so much for thank your you. service. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, of course, Bob, I knew and knew of you before the OPEB days, but when we started this venture, uh, I didn't know too much. And you were an invaluable uh, asset for me and helped me over some of my, my rough edges. <laughs> many would suggest I still don't know too much, but I do know one thing. I'm going to miss you. Godspeed. Thank you, Ted. I would just like to say for the third time, Bob, I'm, we're <laughs> going to de definitely going to miss you. But thank you so much for your service to our, the citizens and the residents of this community. And you've been a, a joy to work with over all these years. And you've always been the epitome of, of, of what a public servant is. And is trustworthy and uh, somebody that we can all look up to. We knew that if Bob Ponkilla was taking, if he was charged with something, he was going to take care of it. And he's going to do it the right way. So we well, I do appreciate that, that Brent. Um, I'd have to say this is, I've gone through this several times with different committees and boards and, uh, you know, that type of thing. But uh, I'd have to say this one's near and dear to my heart. Uh, as Laura had mentioned, it's, you know, I've been involved with it since the start and been very fortunate over the years to work very closely with Laura uh, Francis and, and Doug, too. Doug was, uh, you know, our initial investment consultant. has been in that position since that point in time. Um, I feel very fortunate, again, just to work with uh, such truly uh, professional you know, not only other employees, but also, you know, the folks that serve on these boards that take the time that serve as trustees and uh, members and that sort of thing. So um, it's truly been a blessing for me to be involved with all of these organizations over the years. And uh, I can tell you it's been a, been a great ride being with the city in, in all of these different capacities, and uh, it's something I'll truly miss. Thank you. All right, now I guess we need to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
All right. Congratulations, Bob. Um, item four, we need to elect a vice chair trustee to provide at trust meetings and perform chair trustee ad duties in the absence of the chair trustee. Um, could I get a nomination? Mr. Chairman, I would proudly uh, nominate Lord Johnson. All right. Thank you. Um, any others? All right. All in favor of Lord Johnson as the trustee, say aye. How do we do this? Aye. Need a second? <laughs> second. We've got a second from Neil. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Item five. Approve agreement between the Oklahoma City Post Employment Benefits Trust and ANCO Consulting for a one for a term of one year commencing November 18th, 2019, with the option to renew for four additional year period. Four additional, four additional one-year periods. Matt? All right. Well, good morning. Uh, if, if you will recall, back in May, we, uh, you authorized the uh, city staff to issue an RFP for investment consulting services. Uh, back in the August meeting, we came to you with the news that the RFP committee had selected ANCO as the winner, and you authorized us to uh, negotiate a contract, and this is the third step in that process, and that is approving the contract between the Oklahoma City Post Employment Benefits Trust and ANCO uh, to continue the relationship with uh, investment consulting services. A um, part of that is, you know, they did provide those services before, and uh, so this would uh, negate any other prior contracts that we had with uh, ANCO, or actually that would be Bogdan, which changed to their name to ANCO. And additionally, one note I would like to add is that the signature page, uh, we utilize the one from the city uh, on accident. And so if you, that signature page will change from having the mayor sign that to having the chairperson sign that. But uh, that is reflected, will be reflected on the final signature. Uh, I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I'd right. move approval of the agreement. All right. Got a, a second. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item six, presentation investment of the investment performance review period j ending j September 30th. Doug Anderson is with us this morning. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and trustees. Um, I would like to echo the comments I've heard. Uh, Bob has been a, a consummate professional. Um, he has been excellent to work with. Uh, we have worked together through difficult times uh, and also really good times uh, since we became involved. Um, and just on a personal story, Bob and I share something else now. Um, my oldest daughter just went to uh, college in New York this fall and the last time that we were here just discussing that he has a granddaughter who goes to the same school in New York. So we will be talking about that in the future. Uh, I, just, I had to show him pictures of, of my visit up there last time. Um, thank you uh, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you for approving the contract. This is a this is a engagement that I have had through many names, I guess, uh, of the company that I work for. Uh, hopefully, you have seen a consistent investment theme throughout that time because I know I haven't changed. I just have more tools and resources to, to help folks like you uh, accomplish your investment goals. Um, first of all, we're going to go through the September 30 report, then we're going to go briefly through a 1031 report. And I have a small change that, that Bob is going to help me explain on some of the funds that we have. Um, but as we go through the September 30 report, very interesting when we look at the figures here, and it's very interesting because in our line of work, it is standard to look at the trailing three months and the trailing 12 months or one year, three years, five years. So we have this end point that we start at, which is September 30, and then we have these periods that we look at. And if you look at the September 30 um, quarter, it was modest for U.S. equities. It was negative for international equities, and it was pretty strong for fixed income. If you look at the trailing 12 months, and so this is October 1 of 2018 to September 30 of 2019, returns don't look great because at the end of last year, um, there was a huge wave went through the market that we were going to have a recession. 
very soon, retail sales were off, Christmas sales were really poor. We had a bear market that really, we hit the, we hit the low point Christmas Eve trading session, and the S&P 500 was down almost 20% at that time. So you take that and you add the three quarters we've had this year, uh, 2019, if you start with the 20% in the hole uh, and you move that forward, uh, things look a lot more modest. Um, I will tell you today that the S&P 500 is up over 20% calendar year to date. Um, bonds have done very well calendar year to date. International equities not so great because of trade issues. Um, and I was doing some research over the weekend and there have been, I want to say, 30 or 42 calendar years where the S&P is up 20% through the end of the um, third quarter or going into the fourth quarter of the year. 42. 37 times, 37 of those 42 years, um, you ended up the fourth quarter with another gain, about 5% on average. So you're up 20 and then you tack on a 5%. Again, these are averages, so there's a lot going on beneath that. There are five times when you had a negative return in the fourth quarter. The only problem is those five, or those three out of those five years um, were 2018, when we were down 20%, um, 1987, we all remember that, Black Friday, and, or Black Monday, and uh, 1927. So you've got some pretty rough years uh, mixed in all of them. But again, that's three out of 42 years. So the trend is positive. Seems like the market's being very well supported. Ignore all the political stuff that we're hearing uh, day in and day out. I think that the market is pretty fatigued by that right now and is more looking at long term. Or is the economy in decent shape? Um, and I think that's true. So looking at the report, just remembering this is that in, in between that one quarter return and that one year return is a great uh, run for equities in the U.S. So as we're looking at the performance on page two, you can see for the quarter, uh, U.S. equities were positive except for small companies. Remember that small companies were down, but larger companies were up. Um, the international equities, you can see that above that in the red and the, the pink section there. U.S. Miski Equity, ex-U.S. down 1.8%. The developed markets down 1.1%. And then the emerging markets down 4.2%. So obviously emerging markets is heavily weighted to China. China has, because of Hong Kong, because of the trade issues with the United States, uh, not performing well in terms of U.S. dollar. And then you can see the fixed income at the bottom there. 2.3, 2.4, and then Barclays Corporate, 3%. Um, remember at the end of last year, the best performing, if we go down to that one year performance chart here, mostly on the positive side, we have a few on the negative. But remember at the end of 2018, there was only one of these columns was positive, and that was the three-month T-bill. Everything else was on the negative as when we looked back from year end 2018. So we have had some volatility. Um, when we look at the growth value story, that's changing right now. Remember, we try, we, we, we sort of elementally divide the market up into growth stocks and value stocks. Uh, growth stocks have led the way since 2009, not without interruptions. For the last two years, they have been especially strong. And so we have seen magazine covers and stories saying that value investing is dead. And that was about the point where we started to see value investing coming back again. Um, so September, there was a, a, a moment where value investing started to come back. That t seemed to be a head fake. But October, November has been very, very strong value stocks versus growth stocks. And as we go through the following pages here, fixed income very strong across the board on page A. And the yield curve on page 9, remember the yield curve did invert earlier this year, August, September. That means that long term, uh, yields are actually lower than short-term yields, which as an investor, why would you take any risk by assuming duration risk at that time? And so most folks didn't. Um, that, well, the old saying about an inverted yield curve is that generally it does precede a recession. Um, in fact, inverted yield curves have predicted something like eight out of the last five um, recessions, meaning that just because we have an inverted yield curve does not mean that there's going to be a, an immediate recession. Um, on page 10, Total fund, one-year rate of return, 1.8%. And again, this changes as we roll month by month and quarter by quarter. 
Um, looking on page 12, this is a remarkable chart. Um, it, it truly is. Uh, Bob has lived this month by month and day by day with me, uh, shepherding this along from $6 million in 2009 and probably the most nervous time to start a new institutional investment program. Uh, and we were cautious at the beginning because we didn't want to lose the principal. But as you look over time here, you can see the total fund composite. This is the total return and then the net cash flows. And so what this tells you is the growth of the uh, investments, uh, both through income and capital appreciation, has been over $20 million over that time. That's a significant figure. And as this fund goes on and matures, it should grow even more. So out of that, you can see that the uh, contributions over that period of time have been $66 million, but $30 million has come out. Um, if you see the gains, gains and losses, this is a net um, realized and unrealized of 20.9 or $21 million. Uh, then you have the ending market value. We are above 100% rate of return since inception, and that's fantastic. Um, and then $5.9 million in income that's come back to the system. I really like that figure to the right that says the income percentage is a as a percentage of the beginning value. We have almost earned back through bond and stock dividends, dividends and interest income, almost everything that was initially invested in here. Um, and I think that is the old saw of making the money work for you all the time. So the following pages, uh, just reminding us that we were cautious at the beginning on page 13. Page 14 shows the asset allocation. We are 60% domestic equities, 17% uh, domestic or core fixed income, and we have the active duration fixed income. International equities is, is modest allocation. Uh, we, can, we can increase that over time, but international equities have not performed well, primarily because of the U.S. dollar strength. Uh, the high yield fixed income at 2.7%, and then we have a modest amount of cash there. You can see on the next page where those investments are allocated. Remember, we are in funds, mutual funds, low-cost mutual funds. That's something I'm going to come back to in a little bit. Um, and these are all liquid in case we need to invest or divest. Um, that's always been the case. Page 16, you can see where the market values are. So the appreciation during the quarter, the net appreciation was $50,000. Income was $190,000. And as we go down that list, you can see that fixed income was the place to be. The domestic equity composite did have a struggle um, during the quarter, ended September 30. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the really explanatory page is the next one where we show the allocation of $62.682724 um, for the quarter. The total return was 39 basis points, and there are a couple of reasons why, and we can go down to that in a second. Year to date, here again, this is the figure, year to date, total return of 15.6%. Um, it does not feel like we're up 15.6% calendar year to date. Um, and, and this happens much of the time. Um, and you notice that one ranks in the 12th percentile. You can see the one year return is barely positive at 1.8%. And that one does show at that 95th percentile, if you have 70% equities and you have a bear market, that can't hurt you in the short run. But as we go to the three years, we've, we're up to the top quartile there. Um, we go to the five years. 40th percentile and over the last seven years, 7.17, just below the actuarial assumption for that period of time. Again, what is the figure of success in the long term? It's meeting the actuarial assumption um, without taking more risk than we have to. But there is an inherent design to this plan that we are taking risk. Um, and for that risk, we expect to earn long-term rewards uh, in the portfolio. So looking down the list here, Focusing on the year-to-date and the one-year returns here. So we have Loomis Sales, which is normally a manager who really does well. Uh, when the markets go up, you can see it's lagging a bit. They've taken a, def a defensive posture in the portfolio. Um, when we're looking at double-line fixed income, their returns are also a little bit more cautious. Double-line expects there to be a fairly serious slowdown in the economy and has the position of the portfolio waiting to take advantage of that. Um, Lord Abbott, high yield, um, excellent results there for the year to date, up almost 12%. All these numbers are net of investment management fees. And then we look for the one year, 4.83. 
I guess the, the, the portfolio that is most curious to me right now is the next one, and that's Hoisington. They're invested only in treasuries. Long-term treasuries, that's all they do. They're meant to buffer equity market volatility, meaning that when the equity market is down, they should be good. They're great this year. Um, this is because the yield curve has shifted lower, and they have not made a trade in this portfolio. It's not like they're managing this thing day to day and trading long, trading short. They own 30-year treasuries and 30-year strips, and that's it. And you can see how that goes, 28.85% for the one-year return. This is not a portfolio I would have as my sole fixed income exposure. It's just too volatile. And it is also not a portfolio that I would be contributing a lot of money to right now. Bonds are math. Yields are low. Um, if anything, take some money off the table with this one if we need to. Uh, but again, that's... Uh, Generally speaking, this portfolio only produces those high rates of return, those 20 plus percent rates of return when the equity market is diving. Um, and so it's a unique situation this year. Looking down the list for our equities, um, you can see Vanguard 500, um, 20.47, and for the one year, 4.13. Uh, the Vanguard mid cap index, again, significant change. The year to date looks much better than the one year. Um, Hotchkiss and Wiley is, is in a tough spot right now. I will say that. Uh, they are investing in energy more than any of their peers because they are attracted to stocks that have underperformed recently. Um, and you can see that by the results. I am not ready to throw in the towel for Hotchkiss and Wiley. I have seen this story play out with them in the past. Um, if you look at their year-to-year -year returns, they can be fairly volatile. If you look at them going into the great financial crisis, they had a very difficult year, but then they came out with a 50% um, return on the other side of that. So I'm not ready to f throw in the towel. This is a measured allocation. I think that we should live with this one for a little while longer uh, before we make a change. Uh, Stevens, small cap growth here. You can see there's some volatility here. Small cap, like I said earlier, had a difficult quarter. Um, their relative returns are good. You can see for the year to date, they're up 16.12. Longer-term results are also positive and close, if not above the benchmark. And then Causeway. Causeway is tough. I think we've mentioned this before. They're value-oriented, so that means they're investing in banks. They're investing in one thing they like is tobacco companies, et cetera, like very stable, undervalued, unpopular companies. But most of those banks that they invest in are in Europe, and Europe banking environment has negative yields across the, the curve, and it's a difficult place to make money as a bank. Um, however, they take a, a four-year view um, of each of their positions. And again, not ready to throw in the towel on this one, but, but keeping a very, very close eye on them. The next pages are the uh, fund sheets for all of these. There's a significant amount of detail in those. I won't go into those in the, in the interest of time. Uh, but looking at pages uh, 39 and 40 is very interesting to me. Um, page 39 is a correlation matrix, and what these numbers describe is the performance relationship between each of these funds. And you'll see that if you go down column A on the left-hand side there, that is for Luma Sales Bond, and you notice when we're looking over the last five years, their correlations go from 1.00, which is perfect positive, meaning they track one-to-one, -one, up, down, uh, in, on any day or any month, um, and negative one, meaning they go in completely opposite directions to the same magnitude. And if you look at this, the Loomis Sales Bond Fund has fairly low correlations with everything else there. If you go down to column J, which is the total fund composite, this shows you how the total fund um, correlates with all of the investments. And as you might expect, the highest correlation is to the Vanguard 500 Index Fund. It's the largest investment. It is the one that has the most power here, and it is one that we are very comfortable having as our largest allocation. Similar, um, similar correlation to the mid-cap index. That's G. And I want to check. I didn't I wanted to check this before I came in. So E versus G is a 96 correlation. So those are fairly highly correlated with each other too. Uh, the next page is the. Um, Manager status summary, right now, uh, as of, uh, it's been a while, uh, Causeway is on alert. I want to put um, Hotchkiss and Wiley also on alert because of their performance. Their performance can be short-term 
pretty poor or extraordinary in the first quarter of this year in the market recovery. They're the top ranked mid cap value manager out there. Um, so they do tend to move with a, a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, amplitude to the relative. Doug, so if they're on alert, um, what, what, what's our approach with that? Just they know we're watching. Closely. Yes. Um, we're not necessarily looking to fire them. Fire them at this point in time. Right. It's more of a signal to everybody in the room that these are the ones we're paying more attention to okay. right now. And there are three categories as you see there. If somebody is on notice, that means that is you've got six months to rectify this. Um, and let's see, before I go too much further, I like the next page there. It's going to be page 41. This is the expense summary or the fee summary. These are all mutual funds. These are annual expense ratios that are embedded within the fund. Uh, you can't negotiate these. They're the same for everyone. They come out of the fund, believe it or not, on a daily basis. These take tiny increments out of the fund every day. If you look at this, the expense ratio for the funds that we have, um, and then we have a total at the bottom there, 0.55%. The category average for each of those categories, and then the weighted category average of 1.13. So we're better than half as expensive as average fund out there. And I don't think we're giving up any quality whatsoever. If you look at the difference, we have one that is above F. Well, there's two. I'm sorry. They got, there are two. Stevens is, is three, or I'm sorry, Hotchkiss is three basis points more, and Hoisington is three basis points more than their index. And when you look at that 28% rate of return on Hoisington, I think we got our money's worth out of them so far this year. So this is absolutely prudent and reasonable, and this goes in the fiduciary file. Um, and that concludes my quarterly third quarter reports. Doug, if I may, I think, I think you mentioned in our last meeting that uh, thanks in part to Fidelity and others lowering uh, expense ratios, that we were seeing a general trend yes. in some of these. Is that trend continuing? It is. Not only are you seeing it in publicly traded assets, I don't know if you paid attention, but Schwab, I think Schwab was the first one, maybe it's Fidelity, came out and said, if you do online trading, no commission anymore. And just down the list over the next couple of days, all the other major electronic brokerages did the exact same thing. Um, so trading costs are down. Management costs are down. And thank you for bringing that up because we're going to circle back to that in just a minute. We found some ways to save even more money management fees. Um, that is true. Not only are you seeing that, you're seeing on sort of more institutionalized assets, you're seeing hedge funds go down, fees there. Um, it used to be 2% management fee and then 20% of profits over a hurdle rate. That's coming down to closer to one and a half and 15. Still exorbitant, not a fan, uh, but those are seeing some fee pressure also. And a lot of that is because folks have done what we did a long time ago and said, you know what, for that large cap equity, we're just going to index it. And it's worked. It really has worked. Although there's a book that just came out. It's called, I think, The Man Who, Who Solved the Markets. And it's about a guy named Jim Simons, who was a former NSA code breaker and mathematician. He started a hedge fund called Renaissance Technology. Um, it's the best performing large hedge fund in the world. You can't put money into it. They made so much money, they gave all of their investors money back, and the employees now own all of the money in the hedge fund. The fee on that is 5 and 43. 5% management fee and then 43% of profit. That's incredible. But other than that, everybody else's fees are going down. All right, any other questions? All right, then I, I would like to get a motion to receive this quarterly report. So move. Move. I get a second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Now, item eight. No, actually, item seven. <coughs> item six. We just did seven. Item eight. Receive monthly investment flash report for. Periods ending August 31st, September 30th, and October 31st. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I may, just go through the 1031 report since everything else has been covered in our 930. Uh, if you look at the market environment there, you'd see that uh, October was a positive month. You know, going into September and October of every year, it's kind of fingers crossed because those have historically been more volatile. For some reason, we remember them as more volatile. Uh, if we look at the year-to-date total returns here, our equities were all positive. The international actu equities actually outperformed. And so year-to-date through the end of October, uh, the Russell 1000 was up 23%. The Russell 2000 was up 17%. I mean, this is a fantastic year so far this year. Uh, looking down at the next page, you can see that we added on almost another million dollars uh, during the month there. Uh, market value ended at 63.4, um, almost $5 million, and we're still not quite there at the income being 100% of the initial investment. And then the following page are the returns um, of the portfolios. You can see that our best performer year-to-date gave some back, but when we're looking at the year-to-date total returns here, uh, with one exception, uh, double digits except for the bond portfolios, and it's steady as it goes. All right, any questions? Okay, get a motion to receive the monthly investment flash reports. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 9, discussion and consider approval of additional asset allocation or changes to portfolio fund managers as recommended by the board or the investment consultant. And I believe Mr. Ponkilla has a recommendation here. Uh, yes, this uh, actually references back to Ted's question about the expense ratios. Uh, we were approached by Doug uh, in late August about the uh, possibility of moving into uh, some different share classes that would uh, have a lower expense ratio. Uh, we did check into that to see if that was something we might be able to do, you know, in between meetings, but our legal counsel suggested that we come back to the uh, trust and have you guys listen to uh, you know what Doug has to offer and uh, the thought was to maybe convene the investment committee uh, and then come forward with a rec recommendation but as all of you recall basically all of you are the investment committee so we thought we'd bring it back to the board today to let you uh, listen to what uh, these options are and the savings that will result and uh, let you take that action. If so, then we can go ahead and make that move and uh, perhaps uh, save some money. So I'll let uh, Doug provide you some of the detail on that. Thank you, Bob. Uh, if I could ask everybody to turn back to page 41 of the 930 report. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, investing in Wall Street are all the ways that Wall Street figures out to charge some people more money than others or various ways to extract as much fees out of investors as possible. Uh, and it's inc incumbent upon us to make sure that you're not overpaying uh, for any of these managers. So one of the ways this is done is that mutual funds, like we invest in, have different share classes. Um, and those share classes are generally applied to asset size. So you have the one for uh, retail investors, which we'll just say has a management fee of 1.5%. Then you have one for really rich retail investors, and that one's maybe 1.25% per year. And then you start going into the institutional funds and, and the way that it's the same fund. It is the same, investing in the same pool of assets. It's just under a different ticker symbol. Um, and those ticker symbols are not available to everyone. And in our case, we went through and found, because of all the action you've been hearing about, about this on funds, um, found out that not only are there lower share classes recently available, uh, but also some of the really high um, minimum uh, share classes are now reduced those. And so there are four funds that we found working with our research people and working with the bank that we can go from one share class that you're invested in now to the same fund, different share class, and it's just an exchange. There's no, you don't go out and, and, and do any real transaction. Um, and we found four funds that we can save some money on. Um, and if we look at this, the first one is the American Beacon Stevens Fund, or the Stevens Small Cap Growth. So it's showing 
What in the world? It is showing on this one. STS. A slightly higher. I'm going to go back on this one. There's something strange on this. It's showing a 99 basis point expense ratio on my report. But when we ran the exercise in August, it showed a higher. It showed a higher. We're, can we hold off on this one? Just for. Um, the other ones are the Luma Sales Bond Institutional. So that's the very top one. It is showing a 66 basis point fee right now. The less expensive share class is 59 basis points. So that's a seven basis point um, improvement there. The Vanguard 500 index, and remember this is our largest allocation, is showing a 14 basis point fee um, today. Uh, what we have found is one for four basis points, 0 0.04 basis points. Um, and then the Vanguard mid-cap index, 17 basis points now. We have found a share class for five basis points. So that's a reduction of almost two-thirds. Um, when we add the figures together here, um, when we do the math, Loomis sales, same fund, different share class will save about $3,774 per year. The Vanguard 500 moving to the less expensive share class, $22,514. Same return, just cheaper. That's it. And then for the Vanguard mid-cap index, it's almost $4,500 cheaper. So we add those all together, and it's uh, a little bit better than $30,000. Um, more money to the trust uh, just by switching share classes. And those are the three. I'll go back for the American Beacon and double check that one. So, Doug, you say same, uh, same return. Is it the same performance over time? Slight, slightly higher. The only difference would be the fee. It is the same portfolio. It is just accessed through a different unitized mutual fund. Got it. And remember my old skeptical saying, managers will never guarantee returns, but they will guarantee their fees. That's it. All right, so we need a, do we need a motion to, how do you want to word that, Francis? Well, it's a motion to move to different share classes in uh, three funds, Loomis Sales, Vanguard 500 Index, and uh, Vanguard Mid-Cap. Okay. I'd move that. All right. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Doug. And I'll be back with the fourth fund once I research that a little bit more. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Trustees. All right, item 10, acceptance of the interim financial statements for the three months ended September 30th. And we have Rhonda Shelton here who's going to go over that briefly with us. Good morning. Um, I would like to first direct your attention to the bottom of page 6 and the statement of changes in plan net position. At September 30th, 2019, the trust reported net position of $67.4 million. This is an increase of $5.53 million over the same period um, as last year when the net position was $61.9 million and is primarily attributed to the $5.8 million increase um, in market value. Contributions remain stable at approximately $7 million and benefits paid um, decreased roughly $1 million from $5.67 million in the prior year to $4.75 million this year, mainly due to lower premiums. Now I would like to uh, direct your attention to items starting on page 10 under deposits and investments. At the bottom of page 10, I'd just like to point out that the trust has started purchasing judgments and we currently hold $136,000 as investments. 
And moving on to page 12, midway down, under the asset allocation guidelines. Fixed income securities make up 30% of the OPEB investments, leaving the remaining 69.8% in equities and 0.2% in judgments. And that concludes my, my report for September 30th. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? If not, could I get a motion to accept the interim financial statements for the period ending September 30th? So move. So we had a motion, a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, we're going to receive the actual evaluation for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2019. And our actuary is not here. But one thing I wanted to point out, if you'll look on page three of the actuary report, uh, the summary of results there, the funded ratio, as of June 30 of 2018, we were at 12%. And as of June 30 of 19, we were now at 13.1%. And we can talk about a lot of various things. And uh, Amy Lucas is here if you, if you want to get into the weeds on this. Or uh, that's, the, that's the bottom line of what I, the result I got from this actual report is, you know, our numbers to go up, not down. And that's always a good thing. So uh, Yes, our actuary wasn't able to attend today. Um, if you do have questions and would like to forward those on to us, we can certainly communicate those to him. Uh, we also have some of uh, our accounting folks who have uh, worked closely with these numbers as well, and uh, there may be some things that they may be able to answer as well. But uh, like I said, if you do have something specific, just forward it on to us and we'll, uh, we'll look into it. Any questions? Again, feel free to contact me if you do, and we will um, we will get them answered. With that, I would take a motion to receive the actual evaluation for the period ending June 30. So moved. A second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next one is item 10, 12. Receive schedule of regular meetings for calendar year 2020. Wow. It's hard to say that, isn't it? It is. It's hard to. 2020, that's a big number. So um, they've got it scheduled four meetings, February 10th, May 11th, August 10th, and November 9th. Um, well, that, could I get a motion to receive that? So move. So I got a motion. It's, I get a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 13 is to ratify claims listing. Moving. Moving. We got a mo motion. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Uh, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have one item here uh, on item 14 is to ratify a judgment. Uh, Mr. Box. Okay. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to, uh, since this is the first time that we've done this, to, to bring this uh, to your attention. In our investment policy, in the trust investment policy in Section 3B8, the trust is authorized to purchase judgments uh, as an investment. Now, typically, uh, it's been the practice in the organization of the City of Oklahoma City that the employee retirement system has purchased these judgments, and they do so uh, on a regular basis. This was a unique situation where the employee retirement system administrator felt that there was a potential conflict of interest, and it was not in the best interest of the employee retirement system to purchase this judgment. And the city manager uh, approached the employee benefits trust to see, because that was in our investment policy to purchase that, and on July 31st, this was purchased, and the amount was $135,000, um, as Rhonda discussed in the accounting report. 
Uh, could you describe what the, um, the the investment value of that is for the trust? Okay, for this particular one, the investment amount will be 1.95%. I think we need to ratify the judgment, so I need a motion to ratify the judgment. Since this is in accordance with our investment policy, I would ratify the judgment. All right. Move to ratify the judgment. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, item 15, reports, comments from trustees, staff, and interested parties. I do want to just point out um, that as Bob retires on December 2nd, Matt will take over the helm as the new city treasurer for the city of Oklahoma City. So welcome, Matt. Congratulations. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we are adjourned.